Welcome to our second episode of American Crisis, Breaking the Cycle of Addiction. My name is David Hunt, and I will be your host for today's episode. When I started this, I planned on one show per month. After the latest numbers for the state were just released, showing almost four times as bad of a situation as we previously thought, I could not delay in the taping and release of today's episode. Today's show will be run on a different format. We will be discussing how the opioid crisis is impacting our city, and just how fast help can actually arrive if you are overdosing. It is a fact that in four to six minutes, the brain cells begin to die without oxygen, and in 10 minutes, the brain cells will be dead. I am pleased to have both Wuben Chief of Police Robert Ferullo and Wuben Fire Chief Stephen Adgate as today's special guest. Chiefs, welcome and thank you for both appearing. Pleasure to be here. Okay, our first question is going to be for Chief Ferullo. Chief, I understand that you are a member of the Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan's Opioid Task Force. How long have you been a member of this team? Since just after its inception, so a couple of years, David. Okay, and what basically is your role there? What do you, what's the uh, Wuben Police do? Just involved for educational purposes. Her task force is very educational in nature. Uh, she brings in different uh, uh, support services to expose us to what's available to us helping the community. Um, it's not really a responsive task force or an enforcement task force. Uh, we have those on, on the police side, uh, but DA Ryan's uh, task force gives us the opportunity to stay on with cutting edge treatment and, and support plans for people with uh, struggling with addiction. That's awesome. I've been a member for about several years now, and it's, it's unbelievable what these, this group puts together between the police chiefs, the fire chiefs, the providers. Now, uh, Chief, can you tell me how many patrols does the city have out on a particular, on any given day? How many uh, cars are out there right now? Without getting specifics, yeah. we've broken into uh, uh, several sectors. Each sector has one car assigned to it, um, and they're regional throughout the city. Okay. Now, we get a call, a 911 call comes in. A patron just found somebody overdosed in the men's room at the Wuben Mall. What is a typical response? What do you do as the police department? As soon as 911 hits, what do you do? Well, on, on uh, all, but the, uh, on all uh, medical aid calls, uh, we dispatch uh, two units to the call. Initially, one will get there quicker than the other just because of geographical considerations. But our, our mission is to get there, uh, assess that the scene is safe for the uh, EMS uh, folks to respond, uh, and then do a primary survey of the patient. Uh, and if necessary, uh, take whatever stabilization methods that we can, uh, steps that we can, uh, bearing in mind that uh, for the majority of the Wuben police officers uh, are trained at the first responder uh, okay. uh, level. We do have some EMTs, but their obligation is to respond to first responder level uh, as, as, a, as a whole. Uh, they'll stabilize the patient, uh, evaluate uh, for uh, whatever life-saving me measures may need to be initiated, um, and they'll initiate those measures. And uh, in, in the interim, if there's anything unusual or, or uh, urgent about the call, uh, they'll update uh, uh, Wuben Fire, who uh, you know we work very closely together and Wuben, we'll await Wuben Fire's response. If necessary, um, we have AEDs in all of the cars if it's necessary okay. to initiate CPR. Um, all officers are fully trained and capable of doing that. Um, if they need to do rescue breathing or take what other steps are necessary, um, they're, they're very well prepared to do that in support of the fire department's mission of, of uh, a medical service. Sounds like Wuben's well trained. Chief Edgate, you get the same call. Where would your stationary come in from at the Wuben Mall? Let's say we're gonna put this call at four o'clock. Rush hour traffic, no <laughs> worry. You get the call, what are we gonna do, Chief? Well, we dispatch an ambulance out of our Central Square uh, location, 654 Main Street, and we'd also dispatch our engine company, uh, Engine 2, would, uh, that would be in their response district, and uh, they would shoot down School Street to Mishram Road and, and uh, arrive uh, under the NFPA standards, which are anywhere between uh, four to six minutes. In the rescue the same way. Rescue is a small piece of apparatus so it actually has an ability to get there a little bit quicker. So that's usually the scenario. The uh, rescue company will show up, depending on the location, they'll show up first. And uh, as Chief Rural indicated, they'll perform their uh, primary surveys, get vitals, and act accordingly. Now let's just say there's a three alarm fire and both of your rescues are out transporting to Leahy and to uh, Winchester. What's going to happen if those two ambulances are tied up? What was your solution for this? We call for mutual aid immediately. Okay. Of course, the dispatcher would, would have that information immediately upon receipt of the 911 phone call, and we'd take measures to act appropriately, which would be to call one of our mutual aid partners. In that case, over to the Wuben Mall, we'd first call uh, Reading, Reading okay. County, which are uh, trained at the paramedic level, it, uh, which provides that uh, little extra uh, care, ability for care. And in rush hour traffic, what are the chances that any department at all responding is going to get there four to six minutes if there's heavy traffic? 
I have confidence, all confidence in the world, that we will uh, meet those standards that are set by uh, NFPA guidelines, uh, only because we do have the ability to maneuver through that traffic in an <laughs> yes. appropriate fashion. Yes. Yeah. LNS works every time. <laughs> yes, it does. Okay. The next thing, do you think that people right now are relying a little bit too much on the use of Narcan, thinking that's going to miraculously fall out of the sky and get there on time? I know they say, okay, I'm going to do the drug, the fire department will get there in five minutes, three minutes, one minute. Are people relying on this being available at a moment's notice? So, so I think your, your, your concept of the whole addiction issue may be a little uh, skewed in the, to the degree that I don't think that an addict is thinking about where his Narcan uh, injection is going to come from when he's, when he's doing his drugs. I, I think that it's a, it's a social issue that identifies a lot of problems that, uh, you know, if I knew the solution, then I'd, I'd speak right here. However, the, the fact that we do carry Narcan on all our pieces mm -hmm. of apparatus, our engine companies in, I have it in my own car. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we, I feel confident that we have the ability to respond to a, a patient in need in an appropriate time fashion. Uh, that is all true. The only, my only worry is that's when you get the call. How long is that patient going to be in the restroom unconscious before somebody finds well, him? Well, so that's a, that's a you're, okay, you're right. That's yeah. a, an entirely different and issue. That's what horrifies people that you've got to drop almost a witness to rest sure. for make this work. You can, you can drop a fire truck out of the sky on the roof of the mall. Right. But if he's been down 15, 20 minutes, if no one goes into that stall or has a reason to go into that stall. Unfortunately, yeah, you're correct. It, uh, I mean, and that, that's a tragedy. I mean, people yeah. just think they can go in. It's going sure. to help in a moment's notice. That's right. And of course, they're not going to do it in the middle of the mall. They're going to do it in the restroom where no one's going to see them right. and pray to God somebody finds them. I mean, That's I don't right. go in the restroom looking under stalls. Sure. I mean, it's just a tragedy out there. Right. I mean, we all saw the video, I believe it was a major department store with a three-year-old girl. Her mother overdosed in the middle. It's been all over TV a few months ago. And the girl's tugging on her mom, and the mother overdoses in the middle, in the middle of the department store. Yeah. And That's horrifying to a poor girl watching her mother almost die. The, the, the whole thing is tragic, and, uh, but we deal with it on an all too common uh, notice. We, we deal with it uh, all the time. And you've been with the city of Woodman for how long now as a, fire, as a firefighter and fire chief, roughly total? Uh, in a few months, it'll be 39 years. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you've seen, so you've seen about everything out there? <laughs> Just about. How is the fire department adapting now in the last several years to compare how it was months ago, years ago? Years ago, maybe you got an overdose call every now and then, and now it's happening all the time. How do you adapt? So we make preparations to adapt to current trends. For example, this whole opioid crisis, we, we carry Narcan on every piece of apparatus that we have. We're always up to date with the current standards for treatment for not only opioid uh, issues, but for any other medical uh, response that may come down. It's uh, like, for example, of uh, CPR, yes. and you know this. Yep. We've, just, we've had this conversation in the past. When I first came on, CPR was unrecognizable as to the performance that you do today. Yes. It, uh, all these standards change, and they change for a reason. They change because they find out through medical uh, 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 information that it changes. They, they find out now that by doing, uh, by not doing mouth to mouth, yes. it uh, it enhances a person's ability to recover quicker if you just do chest compressions. I mean, you know this. Exactly. It's, it's just yes. the way that things change. And they're always updating and something, I mean, with choking for adults, back blows are in, then it's out, then it's in again, then it's out because of the different damage that gets done. They're constantly That's right. changing. That's right. And then one person CPR, which is just compression only. For the audience, if you learn CPR and you don't want to put your mouth on somebody you don't know, there is compression only CPR, which you can get from your American Red Cross or American Heart Association, that you can help somebody in an overdose or a choking situation without ever having to put your mouth on the person. Now, how does this take a toll on the responders? I know before the fire department would go in, maybe pull somebody out of a building, <clears> maybe a car accident, but seeing a child or a kid or somebody overdose every night, mentally, how does this take a toll on you guys going home at night when you see someone that may not have made it after your best well, effort? Well, unfortunately, those things that you're talking about happen on an ever too common uh, occurrence now. It happens all the time. So we do have programs in place to address uh, issues, psychological issues that may become a, a factor with a member's ability to perform his job. And if we identify that, we make sure that he gets the help that he needs uh, immediately. But so it's not, it's, it's yeah, not just the opiate. I mean, I think that, that in the last 24 hours, 
I've been at three scenes with your guys that they've seen major trauma. Absolutely, that, yeah. that is not opiate related. And that was my point. It's not just opioid crisis. It's it's everything that we deal with. It's uh, and I won't get into specifics, but there's some been some in just the, the very near past some critical incidents that mm -hmm. would require attention to make sure that our members. The, their minds are in the right place once they get done uh, get done performing their duties, and for the most part, everybody we, we have a, a highly professional department. I'm very proud of every single one of them, and uh, and I think they all perform above and beyond the call of duty. And I will say too that, you know, we we talk about it all the time. We have a great relationship with the police department, and I think that teamwork between the two uh, public safety entities is what provides the citizens of Woburn an outstanding public safety uh, issue. The, the strength of the two, the two departments working together is the strongest it's been in the 38 years that I've been yeah, here. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, they, I they, they, yeah. they do, you know, a little bit of joint training, uh, but they integrated seamlessly. I mean, w without getting into specifics, uh, 12 hours ago they were in an incident where there were probably eight or ten firefighters combined with six or eight police officers, and they executed a, 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 a multidisciplined uh, technical rescue where they, they helped an individual with, with a serious life-threatening injuries. Um, and it, it came together as if it was one team and they were practicing uh, on an ongoing basis. And you know, you leave as a chief, you leave proud of that. Um, there's no, no territorial issues. Somebody said, grab this, they grab it. Uh, and, and the teamwork, the, 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 the esprit de corps, the work together uh, it is tremendous combined with the technology, our ability for interoperability that the, the firefighters, if necessary, can talk to the police. The police can talk to the firefighters. We can talk to both of our dispatchers. Um, an incident command, uh, you know, where it's a medical issue, uh, the fire captain was in charge of the scene, and uh, my guys lined up right with him and, and did what he needed done, and it was a good moment. That's right, and, and it's also an endeavor of both our parts to recognize the changing dynamics of the city of <coughs> Woburn. Uh, cities, uh, Woburn's a growing city. It's not a little town anymore. It's a growing city with big city problems. And from a public safety standpoint, we both get together and agree that the, the, the city needs to, well, the city needs to identify this uh, continuing uh, risk analysis and uh, identify these issues and uh, make those updates possible for us to continue to do our job in an appropriate fashion. Uh, I know Woburn is an awesome uh, department and I understand in 2017 Woburn Police Fire received an award from the Metro Boston EMS Council Region for, for the outstanding uh, team effort of the year on a rescue and that, that's just to be commended, that's in the entire region for which I believe is 64 towns, the Woburn Police, Woburn Fire were presented this award in 2017 for a team response. Yeah, I mean th that's got to be commended of every rescue, of everything that happened in the entire year. Woburn Police Fire did an outstanding job in saving somebody's life. And, and, and that was for a technical rescue over a, a facility over in East Woburn. And it was mm. a great performance. Our guys did an outstanding job. But the truth is, from my opinion, the members of the Woburn Fire Department, in addition to the members of the Woburn Police Department, perform to those standards on a daily basis. It's great to be recognized. We truly appreciate it. That, uh, mm. that plaque is hanging on my wall. <laughs> and it should be. But uh, I also want to recognize the fact that we perform those same duties on not a daily basis, but just about. We have a, a, a lot of critical incidents here in the city that need to be recognized, and our guys uh, perform to the uh, above and beyond the call of duty. And, um, we had a plane crash here in Woburn a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you know that. Absolutely. Was down that at, just, I was down yeah. at the other event when it was happening. We thought yeah. we were going to get called out with you when the call came over when we were at the veterans. So I'm just trying to, it's, it's just an indication of how busy uh, the, the city of Woburn is as far as uh, medical response, fire response, police response. And uh, we feel it's critical to identify this growing risk assessment and to act accordingly. I understand also a couple of years ago we had obviously the downtown fire that was a real arm fire that took several merchants out and took the entire block out. And like I said in a previous show, these men are out on a roof, venting a roof with flames raging 10 feet underneath their feet and they're venting a roof. I mean, what can go wrong? And these guys perform miraculously. How nobody got killed, nobody got hurt at that fire is amazing. But that's between police, fire, DPW, mutual aid working together. I mean, as a citizen of the city, I couldn't be more proud of our department of what they did. I mean, that was above and beyond. Well, thank you. But I, I also still want to identify the fact that fires, there's always going to be fires. So we always want to make sure that we're pre prepared in the appropriate fashion for that event. However, the EMS, portion of what we do now accounts for approximately 75 percent. Wow. Now we feel that we need to be structured to accommodate that 75 percent. 
and uh, in through conversations with the, the mayor and the other city heads, uh, we feel that we're on the right path to identify those concerns and uh, protect the city in an appropriate fashion. Now, the extra expenses cause like not can't. I know it costs money with all these extra uh, expenses and responding to these overdoses. Is this putting a strain? Are you able to get the products that you need? I know the city is quite generous in giving you what you do need, but is it putting a strain on the budget with all this extra expense? Too? Not right now. At the beginning, it did when we first initiated this not can't program, but now we have a we work in conjunction with the uh, Middlesex District Attorney's Office, okay. and they provide us with the uh, with the knock-in that we find necessary. I don't know how long that program is going to run for, but uh, if until they until they do run out of that ability to provide us with the stuff, they provide us with all of it. And then the city will just have to make accommodations to go through our uh, our provider, Lay Clinic, nice. to purchase that stuff. Uh, Chief Rulo, so almost the same question to you. Is the, the cost yeah. of you doing your job and your men going out there increased because of this overdosing and because of the opioid crisis? Is it more money being spent with the department for extra patrols, extra offices, training classes? Is it putting a toll on your budget? It, it's uh, more of a reallocation of resources. Some of the niceties are being redirected uh, toward response, education, prevention, and treatment. Um, so it's not that, you know, the financial aspect, we have a set budget we have to live within, and we live within that budget by uh, uh, moving the pieces around to make it fit for the priorities, uh, you know, the common priorities. I realized when I was growing up years ago that if somebody was on drugs, they walked into the police station, they would stop in possession of drugs, they'd be instantly arrested, wait for go to jail, wait for their hearing if they can't make bail. And nowadays, I understand it's more of, I'm here to help you. Walk us through today, if somebody walked into your station and said, listen, I'm a drug abuser, I need some help, what would you do for that person? Well, I mean, you go back to the old days. If somebody came in seeking help, it, you know, that, you'd have to look at you know, the totality of the circumstances. We're not going to arrest somebody that's under the influence of narcotics. Our, our focus is more on those that are providing. We, have, we as, a, as a group, as, as a police department, as a city, look at addiction as a disease. And we attempt to help people that are struggling with addiction rather than put them into, into the, the criminal justice system. Uh, we're not going to be able to arrest our way out of this. Handcuffs are not going to solve this problem. This is a matter of education, prevention, and treatment are the three levels that we need to go at. To educate from a, from a very young age, uh, to work on prevention and introduction, interdiction of uh, uh, the supply chain, and then uh, should people become uh, addicted, an effort to uh, l help them treat their addiction. So we respond to an overdose. We will never have an intent initially to charge that person that's overdosing with possession of heroin, even if we find a small amount of heroin with them. Um, all bets are off if we find a, 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 a commercial amount with it that we believe that there's an intent to distribute. At that point, then we will effect an arrest. But our, our effort is to get people struggling with addiction the necessary treatment and support that they need to deal with their issues and break the cycle of addiction. So for a small, you're saying for a small amount for personal use, if you find it during an overdose, you're concerned more of treatment and getting them help than punishing them, locking them away. I, exactly. I mean, it's people that are struggling with addiction, and you have to look, at, and, and you're aware of this, that oftentimes addiction uh, originates with a sports injury or a surgery or a back injury or an industrial injury or a, a workplace injury and they become addicted to painkillers yes. during the course of that treatment. And when they can no longer afford the, the legal painkillers, they move to gray or black market painkillers, and ultimately it becomes uh, cost prohibitive, so they then will in fact uh, move on to, to uh, an <coughs> illegal substance. Um, our effort is to break the cycle. And you know, if somebody needs help, we will not arrest them in an effort to get them help. And we have a ton of resources available uh, through Leahy Winchester, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Wood, who's our, our uh, nurse practitioner that's assigned, attached to the uh, NEMLIC SWAT team and to the Southern Middlesex Regional Drug Task Force. Um, is, works tremendous, uh, tremendous works of wonder to get people into the treatment they need. The HEAT program, Vinnie Perro, the fourth mm -hmm. district court, uh, very successful. We're now in our 12th year um, in, in this protocol, this model. And then, you know, I'm blessed to be part of uh, uh, a police chiefs group called the Major City Chiefs, where we have the attention uh, of the uh, the attention of the current Baker Polito administration, where they're being exceptionally supportive um, of, of uh, uh, opiate uh, uh, struggles. Um, the governor and lieutenant governor currently have a 50 million dollar funding mechanism in place 
to focus on interdiction and enforcement um, in regional task force type settings. We look forward to that money hitting the street. But uh, you know, we take advantage of whatever there is. And anything that is mine uh, is Chief Adgates as well, and, and he treats us the same way. We look at this as a team effort. Um, we'll enforce it, uh, and they'll help save lives. And uh, it's very important that the people of the city understand that every single day, his firefighters save lives. Um, you know, my guys will get there, they'll stabilize, but when they arrive, the reason more people aren't dying of overdoses in Woburn are because of these firefighters and, and uh, uh, police officers that respond, but the, the EMS system in Woburn is second to none. Um, so, so on that, two, two different things. First off, i just like to mention that Chief Phil is retiring in a couple of weeks, and he, uh, I, I, I put an offer out for him to come work for the fire department if he wants to. <laughs> task Force 13. But I don't, but I don't yeah, Task Force 13. <laughs> on, on the, uh, just to, to talk about the, 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 the dynamics of the opioid issue. Yes, you know, please. It, uh, you've, you've mentioned heroin a number of times here. It, it is the heroin, but it's more the fentanyl that heroin is cut with, is, which is the true killer. It, uh, it's 50 times more potent than, uh, than heroin, and when these acts get a hold of whatever they're, they're shooting, they don't know what the content of it is, and it's uh, it's the fentanyl that, that truly is the, um, the 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 number one killer. And now, one of the, I just got a notification from the Department of Public Health, which mentions that it's not so much heroin or fentanyl now; it's cocaine and fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the issues that we deal with is that by using Narcan, Narcan reverses the effects of of uh, fentanyl, but it doesn't the effects of uh, cocaine. Two Correct. different uh, Correct. Uh, structures. So it's, uh, it creates an additional problem for us to uh, recognize when we approach and treat a particular person. So there's a lot of things associated with it. There's a lot of moving parts that we have to identify. Fentanyl has the capacity that, uh, I mean, what's the next step? I, I thought I read in one of the publications that they, they have the ability to put it on marijuana. Yeah, correct. So yes, you are. And it's a, so, so what does that do for it? That, that just multiplies it the multiplies problem. It multiplies the dose. A hundredfold. Yes. So uh, again, it, it's a problem like the, the chief identified. It's through uh, education and uh, try to get treatment, proper treatment plans, and uh, to, to get these people in the right place. So, I, I wish I had a, an answer for it, I really do, it's terrible. Speaking of fentanyl, since we brought it up, did your department worry before, if you go to a car crash, I'm an EMT, I've been in dozens of car crashes, if not hundreds, we see white powder, right away, it's an airbag. Yes, it's not good to get into it, you, but we don't go swimming in it. We don't think of ourselves because it's an airbag. You shouldn't have it on you, but we're going to help the patient or the victim of the car crash. So, so it, all, it, it, it allows for the, the, the proper identification of the incident commander to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. That's his responsibility. That's what he's trained to do. And if uh, and he has a suggestion or the idea that it may be Fentanyl Correct. Yes. Or whatever that uh, is spread around the inside of a car. I mean, you can make those uh, determinations rather quickly. I believe once you yes. show up. I've been to. A f you've been to a hundred. I've been to yeah. a thousand of them. And it's uh, you, you. You develop that ability to make those decisions pretty quickly. And uh, and if in fact it is a fentanyl spill, we have the capacity to get the uh, the state hazmat team involved. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's basically a level one hazmat team. They actually have a chemical now that they can spray on okay. the fentanyl that neutralizes it. Well, that's awesome, yeah. that's good so that people a, know. So the, there is progress being made, but still the problem is there. And it's, a, it's, it's an issue for, for us to always be prepared for, for the worst. Um, you explained so much for our viewing audience. Is there anything you'd like for final words you'd like to say to everybody, the our viewing audience, about the drug? Any experience, any message to the public? Well, only probably to, to the degree that if, if uh, somebody, like the chief mentioned before, if somebody comes seeking help, the idea is to get them that help, not to be in a punitive mode and to cast aspersions or whatever. We're there to try to, we're there to help people. And, it's, uh, and, if, and if that's what, would, that's what we do. And, and from identifying, like I think we've had this conversation before, uh, and I've touched on a little bit in this uh, prior, earlier in this conversation, is that we recognize from a risk assessment viewpoint the, uh, the, the true needs for the citizens of, of Wuban. And it's our ability to make that, uh, that have that debate and, and hope that people recognize it and adjust accordingly. Very well put, Chief. Chief Rula, how would you like to close this out? 
Well, first of all, thank you for having us, David. This You're message welcome. is important to deliver. Um, you know, this is a battle. It's, it's, we've been fighting it collectively as a team for, for a dozen years through the HEAT program and through other educational uh, uh, initiatives. And it's a battle we all need to, to get involved with. Um, we need to focus on education and prevention. Um, we need to educate the medical community who are, are very receptive to our input and then uh, carry on in an effort to save these young lives that are being, uh, being lost to addiction. And uh, it's been my honor and privilege to be part of this battle for the last 12 years. Um, and I'll continue uh, you know, in my next chapter uh, to be focused on public, public social and social issues. I want to end today's show just a little bit differently. Chief Furlow, as we know, is about to retire. He spent many years of his life dedicated servant to the city of Woburn. I don't know how many countless lives Chief Furlow, his department, has saved. Chief, I absolutely have to get up and shake your hand for everything you've done for the city. Thanks, David. And Chief Edgate, for everything you, I'm going to get up for a minute. You, your Trust department, me, everything you've the, been doing. The honor's all been mine, you believe me. You guys deserve a handshake. In closing, I want to thank you for viewing. If you need help, help is out there. We have several resources. You have Leahy uh, Hospital, which is able to help you out. We have the Mayor's Coalition of Substance Abuse is available on their website. There are numerous guests that you've seen. There's numerous places you can go for help. This show is able to be viewed on YouTube. It's also on Wuben Public Media Center's website. I urge you to look at our YouTube. Uh, get the link, send it to a friend. We also have our first episode you may want to send that to. We'll be doing a show now probably every couple of weeks where this is such an important topic. So please thank you for tuning in. Again, help is available. All you have to do is simply ask for that help. You have please, fire, EMS, plenty of resources. For the America in Crisis, Breaking the Cycle of Addiction, my name is David Hunt. Thank you very much for tuning in, and until next time.